out by the kidneys in 1821. And uh, Picard was the one who identified that once blood goes through the renal vein, through the renal artery into the kidney, and once it comes out, 60% urea is reduced. And they found out that if the output is less, that means you're having kidney function rather than urea. However, this knowledge was there around uh, 50 years before this thing. And this was the initial classification of AKI, which is still used in the ICU. Whether you are anuric, oliguric, or non-oliguric. That's how simple nephrology is. It can get complicated in the coming slides. Uh, oliguric, anuric means if less than 100 ml in 24 hours, that's anuric. Oliguric, less than 400 in 24 hours. And uh, non-oliguric means you're having good urine output. But still, creatinine is high. You're not able to excrete the waste products from your body. That's AKI. And a uh, lot of definitions were there. Till 2002, there are more than 200 definitions of AKI. And it was very difficult to understand AKI, study it, and further improvise on the management of AKI. And finally, there were two definitions which are uniform from 2002 onwards. One was the rifle criteria. Second is the akin criteria. However, rifle would miss up to 10% of akin identified cases and akin would miss up to 25% of rifle identified cases. And finally, in 2012, the KDGO guidelines came out. They combined both of them together and uh, rifle, which was predominantly based on the urine output and akin was based on the creatinine. And uh, so hence, now we have a uniform definition of AKI classifying into stage one, stage two, and stage three. Stage one is rise of more than 0.3 creatinine in 48 hours or a drop in urine output to less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour for six hours. And uh, hence it goes up in ICU. What is an ICU? It's a designated area in a hospital. That's how it looks like where critical patients are there. And there are many ICUs nowadays in hospital. But to keep it simple, there are two main ICUs. One is medical ICU. Second is a surgical ICU. This is an ICU and this is where the kidney is placed and this sort of an environment is very hostile for the kidney because whatever goes in the patient's body has to go to the kidney. It's metabolized, it's excreted over there. It's a hostile environment and hence AKI in ICU is every second bed in an ICU patient has an acute kidney injury. And this AKI has significant long-term mortality and morbidity. And this graph shows how common AKI it can be as much as 74.5% in an ICU. Long-term outcomes, if you get an AKI today, long-term you may get hypertension, you may get bone problems, you may get certain heart attack, you may end up with a CKD, which is a non-treatable progressive disease. And hence, prevention is the key. And once the patient comes in an ICU, you need to classify whether this person is at risk or not. And this is Claudio Ronco. He's the one who has come up with this fantastic four card. And if you have two, you are at moderate risk. Like cardiologists write low risk, moderate risk, high risk. Even nephrologist has this card nowadays by which we can write moderate risk or high risk. If you have two factors out of these, then you are at a moderate risk. If you have three, you are at a high risk to develop an acute kidney injury. And hence, starting with the clinical scenario, the moment patient comes, why the patient is in the ICU? whether there is sepsis, which is the most common cause, or any other thing. And then the history, what is the age of the patient, what is the background comorbidities the patient has, like diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, liver disease, this increases the risk for AKI. These patients must be identified, must be classified, must be tagged, must be kept separately, that this guy is going to get an AKI, we need to be very careful about him. And then you would examine him properly, especially the volume status. And the most common cause of AKI in a hospital is hypovolemia followed by drugs, including contrast. And uh, the test, any patient in ICU, I think every day getting a creatine is worthwhile. It's worthwhile. Just to save money, you are checking creatine once in a week or once in four days can be catastrophic. By the time kidney is damaged and creatine is not a good marker at all. So this card, I think every postgraduate must have with them, especially ICU intensivist and classify patients at risk for AKI. If you have two of these, you are at moderate risk. There is high chances you may get an AKI. And if that AKI happens, which is preventable, then the patient is at risk for future CKD, future ACS, future CVS, future hypertension crisis. And if three, that's a high risk. So uh, detecting early saves lives. And if you save the kidney, you save many organs because out of all the organs, kidney is that unique organ which has a cross crosstalk with all organs. 
with the heart cardiorenal with the liver hepatorenal with the lungs you have pulmonorenal all syndromes are there with the kidney so save the kidney save the human being save the body and uh, this is that villain which most of the patients identify as creatinine this is its chemical structure and this is a very ritualistic slide which all nephrologists will keep in all the presentations that creatinine is not a good biomarker because it is produced from the muscle it cannot be continuous it depends on your diet it depends on your hydration status and it can, does not identify where the injury is happening whether the glomerulus or the tubules or the interstitium it cannot classify that and certain drugs falsely increase the creatinine like your commonly used drug trimethoprim sulfonamide uh, trimethoprim is the one which commonly increases the creatinine including ranitidine also can sometimes increase creatinine and uh, this is the graph which shows that it takes roughly 8 hours to 48 hours for your creatinine to go up means if you get an injury today then the creatinine goes up by the time the damage has already happened and after damage happens the kidney is very very microscopic organ with roughly 10 lakh nephrons in each kidney you can't stand that you can't treat that you have to just wait for the recovery hence by the time you find out you are already in, into a damage so there are very much newer ideal markers which can be used like ngal or cystatin c which are not commonly available hopefully in future it may come so hence identifying a person at risk and preventing aki is what can had we can do best in an icu so other markers come late in the picture by the time the damage has already happened and this is a test which is going to come in the near future probably by next year we will be having this kidney check which identifies the injury to the tubules if you have an atn which is the most common site of kidney injury in an acute kidney injury in icu especially because that is the area the last part of the pct proximal coronary tubule and the thick thick ascending limb loop of henle where the maximum energy is utilized and once you get an injury over there that is the part which starts dying because there's an active pathways energy is utilized over there and that's the death where happens and if that that death happens these molecules tim2 and igf bp7 come out in the urine which can be identified by nephro check this is something like a urine pregnancy test or a tropoid test by which you just put some drop of urine in the car test it comes positive in 20 minutes and it can predict the chance of getting aki in up to 92% of patients so hopefully this investigation will come by next year in india and by which we will be able to predict the risk of aki the person is going to get in the next 24 hours and prevent potential akis and it's always important to get that i that comes by experience usual clinicians always look at the clinical aki that once that creatinine goes up then only you have a kidney problem but an nephrologist or someone with an experience with an icu sees many more things especially something like a pseudo aki or a covert aki what is a covert aki by the time we get the creatinine high that is called overtake everyone knows there's an aki but even before creatinine goes up identifying that the patient is getting a kidney injury is called covert aki that is the reduction of renal reserve in a kidney and if you are a vegetarian you are at a high risk to have a healthier kidney and a higher reserve uh, because the more the protein you take the more risk for the kidney tubules to get fibrosed and damaged hence the non vegetarian kidney people who are non veg they have a lesser renal reserve than a vegetarian person and uh, aki in india is changing fast in the past 30 years in the initial 1980s 1990s uh, what we found out was aki used to be due to diarrheal illnesses but nowadays the cause of aki is sepsis itself and the aki incidence by sepsis in an icu has gone up from 1.6% to 11% whereas the cause of aki due to diarrheal illnesses has come down roughly half of that hence the cause of aki is infection which is most common second antibiotics third thing is dehydration which are all preventable so how to approach a person with aki we need to always focus on the history and investigations because there is no classical symptoms that you know if you have this you have a kidney problem if you have that you have a kidney problem there is nothing like that so always identifying the urine output keeping an eye on that especially looking at the creatinine doing a test daily is the only key you need to monitor them the regular symptoms are like swelling over the face periorbital peri 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 puffiness and uh, urine routine showing proteinuria hematuria pyuria abnormal abg 
or history of using NSAIDs in the past, especially look at the bills. The patient may tell nothing was given to me. But if you look at the bills, the patient was on an amikacin for the past four days, patient was taking diclofenac for the past four days, such history you will get, especially in the setting of uh, ARB like telmisartan, in the setting of an acute diarrhea, using NSAIDs can potentially damage the kidneys permanently and it can cause acute cortical necrosis. Then examination, as I have told, the only examination which a nephrologist is very keen is the hydration status. If you are overhydrated, it's not bad. The only thing which may happen is you may go into pulmonary edema with diuretics, it may come down or you may survive with an NIV. But if you are underhydrated, if you are dehydrated, you may get a really bad kidney injury which will take time to recover, which, which, which may not recover also. So hydration status always the first few days, keep the patient full, keep him overhydrated. Later on, we can reduce the fluids. The moment you see creatine high, don't stop fluids. Give fluids, always give fluids. The other investigations or the other examinations is the cardiac status, the, whether the patient has any liver problem or not, lymphadenopathy or not, these things should also be assessed. And important to always analyze whether this AKI is new or the patient had a chronic kidney disease in the past. Many a times, as I have told, there is no classical symptom of a kidney disease. A person may have CKD. Diabetic for the past 10 years, never checked. Hypertension for the past 10 years, never checked, never treated. Eventually, creatine was 4. Suddenly, gets an infection in the ICU, creatine is 8. Doubling of creatine happens very fast with the pre-existing CKD because there is no renal reserve over there. And once you get an AKI, the test of time, this table, this graph, this photograph I have taken right from Davidson. This classification is standing for the past 100 years. Whenever you get AKI, always approach in this form. Whether there is something wrong before the kidney, whether there is a pre-renal problem. Pre-renal per se means there is less blood supply to the kidney. And then you develop the causes, whether the patient has a congestive cardiac failure, sepsis, hypovolemia, dehydrated, or you have something wrong within the kidney. Within the kidney is where a nephrologist specializes, like acute glomerular nephritis, like industrial nephritis. These things are may not be much relevant to a physician aspect, but important to look at the drugs. Drugs are the most common cause of an interstitial kidney disease. And the most important thing to rule out first when you get an AKI is whether there is an obstruction. Whenever you have a high creatinine, the first test to do is an ultrasound abdomen. Rule out obstruction. Rule out obstruction. If there can be a stone, there can be hydronephrosis because of that. There can be a large prostate causing obstruction and AKI because of that. Always rule out obstruction. There are just 5-10% chances of getting an AKI due to obstruction, but that is 100% curable and potentially reversible. And what the lack in London Association of Kidney Injury Network says is, whenever you get an AKI, approach it by this mnemonic. Look at sepsis, hypotension. Look at any toxin history like NSAIDs. Patient is taking lithium, psychiatric patient. Look at the drugs, what the patient is taking. And look out for obstruction. Just one ultrasound. Just if you keep a probe on the abdomen, you rule out obstruction. And... Uh, Look for parenchymal disease. Out of all AKIs, parenchymal disease contributes to a very small number, whereas ATN, which is due to an acute hypotensive episode or an infective episode, is the most common. And ATN happens in this area where the maximum energy is utilized, the maximum ATP is utilized, where there are all active pathways and channels used. So this part can be treated and reversed. Whether this area is working or not, the thick ascending limb of Lupa Fenley is found out by doing this test. This is called furosemide stress test. Like a cardiologist does dobutamine stress test, a nephrologist or a critical care consultant can do a furosemide stress test. Whether the tubules are working or not, whether I can still salvage the kidney or not, it's easy. Just give one mg per kg elastic to the patient, wait for two hours, look for urine output. If the output is more than 200 ml, then the person won't need dialysis, the tubules are still intact, you can still hydrate the patient and prevent and ATN to fully set in. It is just acute tubular ischemia, not necrosis. It has not died yet. It is just ischemic. It can be treated and reversed. If this is negative, that's the case. If output is not coming, then prepare for dialysis. Don't wait for the creatinine to go up, for the potassium to go up. Renal replacement therapy may be required. There are various types like intermittent hemodialysis, PRRT, CRRT. But all the studies have shown that Starting late or starting early makes no difference. So you can wait for an absolute indication for dialysis, which can be remembered by this mnemonic, the vowels of English language, acidosis, 
electrolyte abnormalities like hyperkalemia and uh, intoxication like poisoning because of alcohol or lithium fluid overload uremic syndrome patient has seizures because of fits and then those situations you can dialyze the patient those are absolute indications you can wait till they come but provided your center is capable to dialyze within that one or two hours if you are going to have difficulty at night dialyze early by doing an fst furosemide stress test and this is the initiative by the international society of nephrology that we want zero deaths because of aki by the next year and uh, thankfully in almost all hospitals dialysis machine is there and none, none of the patients are dying because of an aki even if an aki comes patient doesn't die because without two kidneys we can survive on dialysis so we need to identify those patients early dialyze them right on time to conclude there is the 5r approach whenever you have an aki as i have just summarized that first thing is stratify the patient classify the patient this patient is at risk prevent an aki keep him hydrated second thing is recognize those guys look at their drugs what they are doing or not identify aki early remove those nephrotoxin which are going on correct the hydration and once you have corrected that you have responded properly then if they are not improving then prepare for dialysis and dialyze on time if you dialyze late the patient may die because of hyperkalemia and once the patient gets an aki he is not going to recover fully because not all recover and the more severe the aki the more chances the person may end up into an end stage kidney disease if the creatinine goes up by 0.4 0.5 it may come back to normal but there is a loss of renal reserve that person is at risk for future akis and the more severe as i have told the aki the less chance of the person to recover hence they need good follow up the creatinine may come to be normal after an aki a patient has gone on dialysis the after that treatment is over creatinine comes down to 0.9 1.0 but that person is not normal he has lost his renal reserve one more hit the kidney is going to fail permanently so these patients should be on follow up for the rest of their lives yeah thank you anything i i thought it will be practical for pgs so try to put in some mnemonics and some practical points which is relevant to all of us nice yes. Energetic presentation. Sir. Can you have any doubts? Audience. One point I would like to re-emphasize is that kidney disease can be prevented. It can't be treated. Most of them. This is a fact. So delaying the intervention, because once the blood supply is stopped, we can't put in a stent like a cardiologist. We can't do some banding like a gastroenterologist. so there are many nephrons we are born with limited once they die they never come back and any person coming to you especially in an icu is at risk for aki and one aki is devastating for the future of that patient it can cause further ckd so identifying them and the only treatment we have is hydrating keep them full keep them over hydrated because pulmonary edema can be treated but once that kidney gets damaged It doesn't come back. No, I'm sorry. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. It was very interesting and informative. I request Doctor Rashid and I request to present a moment to Doctor Mohan Sir. Thanks. Sir, thank you, sir. Very nice. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. We have Dr. Vijay Prasanna Parini on the topic of the development of the investigation. Sir, thank you.